Ladies and gentlemen, today I am lucky enough to be sitting on the stage right now with comedian Kevin Burke, and we just watched <laughs> the show. I mean, would you yeah. classify yourself as a comedian? I, I think that's fair to say. I'm, I'm a, well, in this job, I'm a comedian and an actor because it's, it's a book show. You know, there's a script that I have to follow. But my time spent as a stand-up comic helps me to make people laugh and to make the show funny, as well as my time spent as a circus clown. Tell everybody what the title of this show is and what it's all about. I will do that right now. This okay. show is called Defending the Caveman. It's a one-man Broadway comedy. It's the longest running uh, one-man show in Broadway history. And it's a, uh, it's a play about men and women in relationships, how we communicate differently and how those differences cause us to misunderstand each other. For example, if a woman says, I'll call you, she means when she gets home. If a man says, I'll call you, he means before he dies. <laughs> And we explain exactly why that is. And there's this, really, this show is a lesson for a lot of people. Yeah. A lesson about the differences between men and women. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's why I like doing it, because it's a show that brings couples closer together instead of tearing, up, uh, tearing them apart. Nobody gets bashed. You know, neither side's right. Neither side's wrong. We're just different. And people walk out having fallen in love all over again. It, it definitely increases understanding. I mean, I'll be married 29 years. Oh, congratulations. Thank you, but yeah. I'm listening and I'm saying yes, yes. Yeah. But then, of course, you know, I also recognize some male in me too. Sure, that says, oh sure, you know, yeah. Well, it's all based on the hunter-gatherer perspective right. of human evolution, how in prehistoric times, men were hunters, women were gatherers, and it's just different strengths and jobs to ensure survival. And we've, you know, evolved with different instincts. A hunter out in the woods is silent, he's quiet. You can't scare the game away. Gatherers out gathering fruits and nuts and berries keep up a constant conversation, you know, among the women, among the children, to make sure nobody got picked off by a predator. And that's why today, men will speak 7,000 words in a day, women will speak 20,000 words in a day. And now you know why. Exactly, very enlightening. Yeah. He <laughs> so, wrote a good play. Rob Becker's the playwright. He wrote a great play. Right, absolutely. I agree. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. So. You and I yes. were talking about passions, and you know that we're on a 50-state tour. Yes, and this congratulations. Is, thank you so yeah. much for that. Mm -hmm. And this is state 24 for us. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow we stop in Utah. It's going to be 25. Oh, that'll be fun. And so my question to you is, because you, we're going on the fly here. Sure. I don't know. You have no how, idea what I'm going to say. No, and I'm, I'm intrigued by it. So what's your passion? I love to make people laugh. It's really that simple. But the important thing to me is the quality of the laughs and the laughter, the, the feeling that it evokes in people when I make them laugh. If this show was, I mean, and this is no offense to the man I'm about to mention, but if this was Andrew Dice Caveman, I would have no interest in doing it because it would be a thing that makes people go, oh, even though Dice is hilarious, I, I, I love a show that brings people together and that makes people happy about themselves. So what other roles in your life do you play in which you make people laugh? Well, this is it. This is, uh, <laughs> this is the place where I do that. In the what? past, I've been a stand-up comic. Uh, okay. I was a circus clown with right. Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. Uh, but my entire career has been spent as an actor and as a comic. Making but no, people laugh. Yes, yes. Uh, in my normal life, in my regular everyday life, I'm not funny at all. I really am not. I, I disagree because um, we talked to you before the show and mm -hmm. the last thing you said to us had us all laughing. Yes, well, I can be witty in, and amusing under controlled situations. <laughs> Out in the wild where I have to be spontaneous, not so much. The funny one is actually our technical director, Troy Geigas. He's hilarious out, outside of work. <laughs> I am, I'm boring. I really am. I'm very quiet. What kind of hesitations or challenges then have you had getting into this? into this Acting, show speak. Oh, laughing, get, really do, like, none. doing it. Really none, because I feel real at home where there's a separation. I can talk to big groups of people. I've done Caveman f in 4,000 seat theaters and it, with Ringling Brothers, 25,000 seat arenas. But there's that distance between me and the audience. See, at a cocktail party or in a gathering of friends, I'm, I'm very often the one that just kind of sits back and watches everything. So how are you feeling right now with me this close to you? I'm fine because this is part of my <laughs> job. I can do this. <laughs> okay, so what do you... One-on-one, -on -one, I'm great. It's in groups of people that I just kind of shut down a little bit, which is uh, it's odd because Vegas is, is a place of such incredible 
constant bombarding stimulation. And I go out here on Fremont Street and sometimes I get overstimulated. I just shut down, I go, I have to go now. I think the average person would though. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's an exciting place to be. It really is. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm proud of this show and its success is that it's not a big show. Like most of the other shows in Las Vegas are big and, la and they have to compete with each other and with Las Vegas itself. But this is a quiet little show. It really is. It's not, you know, there, there's no showgirls, there's no tigers. Uh, it's just me and a bunch of thoughts. And, and I, I'm very proud of our success. We're, we've done 4,000 shows here in Las Vegas. Wow, I was just going to ask you how long you've been doing it. Yeah, I've been doing it since 2003. Okay. And so right now I'm up at about 5,000 shows altogether, and here in Vegas, 4,000. Now during the um, during the show, you said you were on Oprah. Is that yes. true? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. I was on Oprah on April Fool's Day of 1988. It was that long ago. And. What were you doing there? I did stand-up comedy. She had a bunch of Chicago comics on, and I was one of the comics that she invited onto the show. She was she was syndicated at that point, so she was she was national, but she wasn't Oprah. She was just Oprah, if that makes sense. If that makes sense. Yeah. What um what makes you laugh? Weird things. Troy makes me laugh, as I said before. Troy Gigas, he makes me laugh. He's hilarious. Um, Comedy-wise, I, I like things that's a little off the charts and, and a little edgy. Sam Kinison made me laugh. Chris Hardwick, you know, he's the host of uh, The Talking Dead, the show that's on after The Walking Dead. His stand-up comic to me is, uh, comedy is hilarious. He's very smart, he's very edgy, and he's very quick. His show moves very quickly. He makes me laugh. You know, I know that this, this play was written by somebody else, but yes. you bring so many elements of yourself and your life and your wife into this. I mean, in the video on the sides, that was that your wife? Uh, actually, no. Uh, my <laughs> wife had just had our son, Griffin, and she, she, we had to, I had to travel to Oklahoma City, of all places, to shoot the video, and she was not available for the shoot, so that's an actress that we hired. The actual Karen is very different. But it has you, Yes, too. of course, I mean, yeah, you know? sure. Okay, so what do you think you've learned about yourself through all of these years and all of these performances, whether it's from this show or mm -hmm. acting and, and comedy in general? I would say the most important lesson that I've ever learned is to, as much as you can, and with every opportunity that comes along, say yes. The reason I'm in Las Vegas, and, and I'm going to brag on myself, I was a 2008 Las Vegas Entertainer of the Year, doing this small little tiny little show. But it all started in Indianapolis. Um, my daughter McKenna, who I talked about at the end of the show a little bit, she was two and a half. And I wanted to do a play just a regular play that she could come see instead of nightclub comedy. Regular play that she could come see so that she would understand a little bit about what dad does. So at the local children's museum, I did a children's play. So I was acting in the children's play. The director of the children's play said, uh, the Phoenix Theater, a theater downtown, is putting together a 48-hour arts event to benefit the arts organizations in lower Manhattan who were affected by 9-11. And she said, they're doing 48 hours uh, in one hour slots. Call them if you want to do a slot. I said, okay. I said, yes. So I called and I said, I'd like to do a slot. And they said, all right, what slot would you like to do and what would you like to do? I said, well, I'm a stand-up comic, so I'd like to do stand-up comedy at 8 a.m. Silence. Why 8 a.m.? Well, because I'm going to do my stand-up and I'm going to cook breakfast for everybody that happens to be there at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning. They said, all right, you got it. So I did that. Then... The artistic director of that theater said, you know, do you happen to have a one-man play? And I said, yes. And he said, because I'm one one-man play short uh, in my new plays festival, and I've got a lot of death, a lot of AIDS, and I need something light and something. I didn't have a play written. I had nothing. <laughs> but I went, yes. Mm -hmm. And so I went ahead and uh, I wrote a one-man play. And it was about being a dad and how being a comic and a former clown sort of informs my life as a parent. And at the end of the show, McKenna came on with her clown nose on. She did circus tricks. Ta-da. Well, at the exact same time, Rob Becker, the star and playwright for Defending the Caveman, was looking for somebody to replace himself. And some mutual friends said, you know, you've got to play about family, dad. He's got this thing about, you know, caveman, family, and, and being a husband. You guys should talk to each other. And I said, yes. And they, they said, uh, I, I contacted Rob, and he said, all right, I'm going to send you the script. I want you to put a couple of pieces on videotape, send it back to me. I said, yes. 
So I did that, and that got me into the audition process. And I think he saw about 3,000 actors, and he chose me. That's amazing. So all along, I've always said yes to things that opportunities that just popped up in front of me. I became a circus clown with Ringling Brothers because I woke up one morning, I was 25 years old, and on the uh, radio, I heard the, uh, the radio, the DJ saying, you know, today they're having ringmaster auditions for Ringling Brothers out at the Rosemont Horizon out here in Chicago. Uh, go and audition. And I went, yes. And I went and auditioned, and they had me sing. And that was when they looked at me and said, you really should think about going to clown college. And I did that. That put me on the road with the circus. So the most important lesson, every opportunity, no matter how insignificant, or, or oddball you might think it would be, say yes. I like that advice. Thank you. Something else that I noticed you were talking about in the play, mm -hmm. because I'm all about envision something for yourself, explore what it would take, and then execute a plan. It's funny that you should say that. Yeah. Because when Karen and I were first married, I would sit out on our balcony in our little apartment in Mount Prospect, Illinois, and I would smoke a cigar, and I would think to myself, I want to have my own show in Las Vegas. I'd wanted a show in Vegas ever since I was a kid. My parents brought me here when I was, a, a, when I was 12. <laughs> they took me to see Red Fox, <laughs> which was probably not the best choice if you don't know anything about Red Fox. Really dirty! Um, but in that moment I was captured and I wanted to have my own show. So sitting out there smoking that cigar, I didn't know how I was going to get here. I didn't know how, what path I was going to take, but I knew I was going to get here. And lo and behold, I've had not only one show, but two shows. Uh, I used to do this show over at the Golden Nugget, which is two doors down. And then I would finish that show, run over here, and at 9.13 p.m. every night do my own one-man show. So I know not only got one show, I got two shows in Vegas. And we did that for five years. What kind of advice would you give my audience on that? Regarding? On envisioning for themselves and making it come true. I'm really good on the envisioning part. I, you know, I can really sit there and go, this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want. I'm not so good on making a plan on how to get there. I'm going to admit that to you. But I think that if you do visualize that stuff, that anything you want for yourself strongly enough and often enough, you will at least take the path that leads to that and you'll see, maybe not consciously or maybe not fully aware, you'll see the, the path that will lead you to that. But boy, when it comes to making and executing plans, I'm horrible. I no, really but, am. But you're not, though, because they said, be a clown. Go to clown school. So you envisioned yep. yourself being that clown, yep. right? Yep. You explored where to go to school, sure. and then you, you went. Yeah, That's I had, the execution. I had no intention of, of ever being a circus clown. I never, I'm not, you know, the Toby Tyler story. The first circus I really saw was the one I was in. You know, but I went to clown college. Sounds and I like my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> that was my uh, joke. And I wanted to learn about physical comedy. I wanted to learn everything I could about physical comedy. Because uh, I had trained in improv at Second City. I had trained classically as an actor at Indiana University. And I thought, yeah, physical comedy, that'll be great. I'll add that to the resume. Lo and behold, they offered me a job. So I got to ride an elephant for 10 minutes every day, sometimes three times a day. And the execution is saying yes. Yeah, say yes. Just say yes. You know? Opportunities will present themselves, and you may not see how it will lead you where you ultimately want to go, but it will. How long does it take to go to clown college anyway? Well, at that point, it was 10 and a half weeks, uh, and it was you were up at 8 a.m., and you didn't go to sleep until, you know, you didn't even stop until 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, and you were at a dead run the whole time learning everything there is to know about being a physical comedian in big arena tours. So makeup, you learned how to make your own costume, you learn how to take pratfalls, learn how to juggle, learn how to stilt walk, ride a unicycle, and most importantly, how to be funny in front of massive numbers of people. We had a guy who was in the army, and he said the clown college was tougher physically and mentally than uh, army basic training. We had a marine who said it was almost as tough as marine boot camp and you know how Marines are about that. Right, mm -hmm. so are you gonna tell us the trick? How do they get all those, all those clowns in the little Volkswagen bug? Oh, I could tell you that, but it would spoil the fun for you. <laughs> but, but I can tell you, I will tell you this, they're in there. There's no whole trap door in the arena no. floor. No, they're in there, they are in there. Yeah, we had 24 clowns in one car when I was on the show. 
And the theme of they're it not was, just coming through from the other side. No, because the the arena is 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. People could see all the way around. Uh, our, the theme our year was uh, classic Hollywood films, and I was the last one out of the clown car. I was King Kong, so I was in a full <laughs> gorilla suit. Uh, in Dallas, it was like 110 degrees. I passed out in the car. Oh my God! But I will tell you this. Uh, uh, um, I will tell you this, this is a secret, and I think I can tell you, I don't think I'll, I'll get uh, chastised for telling you. Uh, clowns uh, in a car packed in all together, let's just say lots of farting contests. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, on that note. We're ending on farting contests? Yes, Are that's you kidding perfect. me? There you go, farting contests. For a comedian. Best I... decision I ever made, <laughs> farting contests. <laughs> So how can people find your show? Oh, at thed.com. It's T-H-E and then the letter D.com. That's where you can get tickets. And, of course, defendingthecaveman.com. And uh, we have a Facebook page. It's, uh, I think it's called Defending the Caveman Las Vegas, uh, aptly named. Uh, and those are the best places to find us. That's awesome. Thank you so much for oh, having us in you. today. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Appreciate really it. Really appreciate it. And I talk to you, 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 and we love, we love, and we hate, we hate, and we tap.